So I am so happy to be able to introduce Patrick Sullivan. Um, so Patrick was my mentor at Emory uh, University and still a, a close friend and colleague. Um, and I, I have him to blame, I guess, for pulling me into <laughs> HIV research over a decade ago. So Dr. Sullivan is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Epidemiology at Emory University's Rollins School of Public Health. He's co-director of the Prevention Sciences Corps at Emory Center for AIDS Research, CIFI. And before coming to Emory, Patrick has worked at, Patrick worked at CDC as an EI office, EIS officer and in the HIV surveillance program. And his research focuses on many things, but really HIV among men who have sex with men, including behavioral research, interventions, and surveillance. Um, and I'm sure that many of you have heard his, uh, his name before, so we're very excited to have him uh, back for the course. So he'll be talking about survey design uh, for studies of sexually transmitted infections. So take it away, Patrick. Thanks for the kind introduction. And, uh, and I know you guys had a short break, um, but uh, it's good to have you um, join this conversation about survey design, particularly for studies of, of sexually transmitted infections. I am gonna try and be a little bit interactive. So if you have your chat screens open, I'm gonna do some polling. Um, and just to get us uh, warmed up, if you wanna just pop into the chat box and you can um, respond to me or everyone, how much you know about questionnaire design? Have you never uh, done questionnaire design before? Or maybe you've heard lectures about it, but never designed one yourself, designed parts of it, or you've designed and administered your own, or maybe some of you teach about this. So this will give me a, ch a, a sense of where everybody is. It looks like a lot of people have, um, have designed and administered their own questionnaires, but some other folks who haven't done it before or just had lectures, so. Um, thank you all for weighing in and we'll use this uh, voting just like this throughout the lecture um, to try and keep it interactive. So, um, so uh, I think some of the principles here are, we just wanna review some just basic principles of good survey design. And when we're talking about sexually transmitted infections, uh, issues of sex, sexual identity and sexual risks are sensitive questions. Um, another, principle I want to talk about is using technology to unravel the complexities of sexual networks, um, but only when those complexities make a difference. So there are some issues like um, the pattern of sexual partners that actually have a lot to do with the risk of, of acquiring STDs or HIV, and technology can help us untangle those. Uh, third, we want to use methods to put sexual acts in the broader context of sexual partners and sexual networks. So asking whether someone has had unprotected sex is informative, but it really matters whether that's with a partner who's known to be HIV neg negative, thought to be HIV negative, and how that fits into a pattern of partners. And finally, j just as a good principle of science and epidemiology and behavioral epidemiology, using laboratory methods to compare other data sources. So if we know that when we ask questions, we're subject to some misclassification bias. People may not know that they're living with HIV and report their status as negative, um, or there's also social desirability bias. So where we can, we want to use laboratory methods to try and validate the extent of that misclassification. So I'll get into all of these. So in the broad sense, um, and the big, big sort of 30,000 30, foot high perspective is that as we're developing a survey, we want to create a survey framework. And I'd encourage you to use a pretty formal process of, of stating you know, what's the purpose of this questionnaire? Do you have hypotheses or objectives? And what are the characteristics of the respondents that you need to take into account? Um, for example, education level, will they be answering um, a, a interviewer administered questionnaire or doing it on paper or doing it on a computer? All those will, will guide how you develop your items. Um, developing survey items, defining domains, and then putting questions within them, writing them, writing responses, um, piloting them um, with potential participants to see if they're well understood, putting the survey together, what are the rules about how you'll administer it? Uh, what, is, what are the guidance about the, the order of items, which should come first? How do you transition between modules? And then I'll show you some examples later on, but we wanna document the survey up front. Let's give it variable names, code how the responses are gonna be collected and develop a data dictionary. 
So we think about respondent factors, um, think about the population. What is the demography? Where are they gonna be responding? How high is their literacy? What is their motivation to complete this survey? So for example, if we're surveying women seeking STI testing in Title X clinics in the US South, that gives us a lot of information about how we need to construct that questionnaire. We know that health literacy is lower in the South, for example. Um, sampling frame, again, taking some of these same uh, considerations and domains into account, but we might specify US MSM who've had sex with a man in the last year and are on Facebook. And then how are we gonna administer it? Administ interview or administer surveys may be preferable for some kinds of complex surveys, um, but they also may be worse for getting reporting of some sensitive behavior. So we might decide we're gonna use self-administered web-based um, surveying that includes adaptation for mobile devices. In the domains, we can think broadly about things like demographics, family status, and sexual behaviors. And then we'll populate those with specific items. You may be able to use items that have been previously developed. Uh, when I worked at CDC, I, um, I uh, worked, uh, my branch developed the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance uh, Survey and the Medical Monitoring Project. So I still go back to those questionnaires, um, which CDC uh, uh, graciously makes available online. And I try and reuse questions that have been tried and true where I can. If you need to write new items, remember um, that you may uh, have a question like how many male partners did a respondent have uh, condomless anal sex with in the last three months? But that's kind of a complex construct to put in a question. And you may be better to break it down like asking, in the last three months, have you had sex with men, women, both, or neither? A very sort of non-value laden um, way to ask this. And if they've had male partners, we say, how many male partners did you have anal sex with in the last three months? And then of those two partners that you told me you had, how many did you have anal sex where you or your partner didn't use a, a condom the whole time? So that, that question that we have really may need multiple items to decrease the cognitive burden for a participant of answering it. So here are some principles of item writing, and then I'll show you some examples and we'll try and pick out the flaws with them. You wanna try and write a complete sentence that focuses on one idea in the question. Um, be sure it's pertinent. Use simple conventional language. If there are unusual terms or acronyms, you should define those. If you're asking about a behavior, ask about the time period in which it occurred. Not did you have anal sex without a condom, but the last time you had anal sex or in the last three months have you had this behavior. We'll talk about unloading sensitive issues and making response tasks manageable. And then there are also some don'ts. Don't use not, you, in generally in questions, don't use double negatives. Don't write ambiguous items or use jargon. Beware of leading or value-laden questions. Uh, and don't include two or more constructs in a single question. We call this double barrel um, questions. Um, so this don't include two, but try to focus on one idea. Simple language, um, shorter questions are better when you can. You wanna try and be straightforward, um, not, not uh, necessarily chatty or overly familiar. Um, and define concepts and measures. So look at this question. One drink is equivalent to a 12 ounce beer, a five ounce glass of wine, or a drink with one shot of liquor. During the last 30 days, on days when you drank, how many drinks did you have on average? So this is kind of cognitively burdensome. But in the NHBS questionnaire uh, that was developed at CDC, they accompany that, this question with this picture. And that really helps to define those concepts and measures and makes the question you're asking more relatable to people. So where you can use simple um, uh, figures like this to clarify, that's a great thing to do. Manageable task means reasonable recall and to help people along with that if possible. So if you're asking about time periods, you might have a calendar if you're doing this in person where you look at the months, or you might ask people, um, you know, we're gonna be asking about uh, things that have happened in the last month. That would be uh, between today and the first day of July. Where, where were you uh, living on the first day of July? What were you up to? Oh, you were just starting back to school. Okay, well, let's use that information to help you think about uh, that and remember that time frame. 
um, it's better not to ask people to do calculations. If you ask um, what percent of the time do you use condoms when you have sex, that actually requires two numbers, right? How many times did I have sex? And then how many of those did I use condoms? As an investigator, you can help people out by breaking this down and asking how many times did you have sex in the last week? Four? Okay, of those four times, how many times did you use condoms? Then you can do the calculations. Unloading items is critical in the work that we do uh, because a lot of the things we ask about can be value laden. And so these questions are susceptible to social desirability bias where it, especially for an in-person interview, people may be hesitant to tell you about behaviors that they feel like um, would be judged harshly. So a loaded item might just be, did you use a condom the last time you have sex? Or how many times did you exercise last week? We, we, fee, we may feel like there's a societal expectation that we're using condoms a high proportion of time or we're exercising frequently. Unloading just means recognizing up front that behavior is hard. And so in that question, we could say many people, many times people want to use a condom every time they have sex, um, but they may uh, forget or not have one available. How about you? The last time you had sex, did you use a condom? Many people want to go to the gym, but often we get busy or uh, find that we don't have time in our day. How did last week go for you? How many times did you go to the gym? Um, pregnancy also uh, can be a particularly um, challenging it, depending on the pregnancy outcomes and the circumstances and how a woman feels about that pregnancy. So just unloading by saying pregnancy can be a difficult time for some women. We're going to ask you about some things that may have happened before during your most recent pregnancy. We're just recognizing uh, that it is a challenging time. All right, my last bullet is don't be annoying with questions. I, I take questionnaires and, um, and when I find something like this, I just stop. So here's a series of questions. How many male partners have you had sex, anal sex with in the last month? And the respondent answers one. And okay, was that last anal sex partner a main partner or a casual partner? He was a main partner. And then later in the questionnaire, with how many different casual partners did you have sex in the last month? And what is your reaction to that question? Mine is this, because you've already asked me how many sex partners I had, and I told you I had one, and I told you it was a main partner. So we should use technology to skip out of questions that we should already know the answer to as interviewers. And you'd be surprised how many times this kind of logic isn't built in. And as a respondent, I just sort of stop at that point because I don't think this is a serious um, approach to measurement if you haven't uh, paid attention to this level of detail. All right, so let's look at some examples. I'm just gonna ask you to, um, to respond uh, to um, potential problems. So the question here is the government should force you to pay higher taxes. Which of these is a problem with this question? All right, most people are already feeling like it's E and I agree with that. Um, the, use force, the, the use of the term force you to pay higher taxes really imposes a burden on this. It's, it, it conveys an anti-government sentiment and a negative sentiment about taxation that really may influence how respondents um, feel comfortable answering that question. All right, how about this one? How likely are you to go out for a dinner and a movie this weekend? Great, so a lot of you are identifying that this is a double-barreled question. What if I went out for dinner but not a movie or a movie but not dinner. Um, it may be cognitively challenging to figure out what to do with this question. This one is not responding with a letter, but you can actually just type in what problems you see with this question. The last time you shared needles, who did you share with? A sex partner, a friend, a relative, someone I drive buy drugs from, or an acquaintance? What's the problem with that question? This one's taking a little longer for people to type. Assuming they use needles, an assumption overlapping, the options aren't mutually exclusive. So many problems, <laughs> I like that. Um, you might say uh, you can give multiple answers. So I think you guys, um, you guys got a lot, of, uh, a lot of the pieces here. 
um, which is one, we were making an assumption that people share needles. Maybe we had a, a, a screener question before this, but one of, I think the two big problems are that these aren't mutually exclusive. Someone can be both a sex partner and someone I buy drugs from or an acquaintance uh, and someone I buy drugs from. And it's also not exhaustive. There are other, um, there are other types of people that would be meaningful from good to know about from a prevention point of view that aren't in this list. All right, let's do uh, one more. Here you can pick all that apply. Did you use condoms consistency, consistently and correctly when you had sex? So people are choosing some combination of A, lax definitions. If I'm um, somebody who comes in to take your survey, what does it mean to use condoms consistently? Is that every time? Is that nine out of 10 times? What does it mean to use them correctly? Does that mean how I put them on, how I took them off, what lubricant I use? Um, the question is double barreled for sure, con consistently and correctly. It doesn't specify a time period. And I think it's leading. This is one you might wanna unload to say that um, there are lots of people that reasons that people choose not to have condoms or, or have trouble using them all the time. How about you? Last time, you know, when you had sex, did you use these condoms? So. You guys did a good job of picking out some problems with that one. All right, this is a little bit different question. Which of these items are, so you're gonna give me two letters. The first letter is which of these are you most comfortable telling a study interviewer? So you're sitting with a study interviewer across the table and, um, and they're asking you a question. First letter is which you are most likely to, uh, most comfortable telling them. The second is which are you least comfortable telling them? So you, in your response, you can put two letters. So if I'm most comfortable telling them my educational level and least comfortable telling them whether I use met methamphetamine, I would put EG, for example. And what I already notice here um, is there's a lot of comfort with telling people your occupation. Some people have already said that they're least comfortable reporting their income. Um, some people are less comfortable reporting their income than whether they've used methamphetamine. And this actually is, um, is, uh, is not um, surprising in some ways because income is a very, uh, very challenging thing for people to report. People are much more willing generally to report their occupation or their educational level. And so you need to figure out what you wanna do with this information, but often occupation and educational level give you a lot of information about socioeconomic status and may be much more acceptable to people to report than reporting their income. So consider whether you can get the information you need, for example, about socioeconomic status by asking one of those more acceptable um, questions. Uh, income can be kind of a third rail. All right. Just a couple more things about design and then we're gonna move into some examples. Um, and not, we, a lot of us use anonymous surveys. I would just caution you to remember that there are some things um, that uh, uh, constitute personally identifiable information that we may not always think of. So for example, dates of birth um, would constitute PII. Ages that are over 80 um, can constitute PII. So you may think I'm doing an anonymous survey and I'm just asking people's age. But if you do that, you need to cap it so that it's 80 or over um, or some number because you don't wander into collecting personally identifiable information. And then IP address. If you're doing this electronically, the IP address is identifying. And so you have to specifically set up your survey not to record that. Often the default is to record it. So that's just a couple um, things to pay attention to. If you're using online surveys, um, you uh, need to pay attention to fraud. And there are some good papers I can share. I can send Christine and the course uh, moderators one that they can share with you. But you know, how do you make sure that the, your link to your study doesn't get spread around and, and someone does it over and over to try and get an incentive? So fraud can be a concern. With online um, surveys, we think about selection bias for sure. And it may be that some people don't have access to the electronic means to participate in surveys. And so what, how does that bias our sample? And lastly, I'm gonna talk some, in some more detail about consent, because I think consent is a really interesting issue for online surveys. So this is a study 
um, that uh, we uh, did at Emory. And, um, and, in, and the question really here was about what consent looks like for online surveys. So we had 665 um, MSM who enrolled in this study and we randomized them to get their consent for the study in one of four different ways. And I'll tell you what those ways are in a minute. Our outcomes were how well people understood the consent elements and how much time they spent in the consent process. So to be in this survey, participants had to be male, have had a male partner, sex partner in the last year, live in the United States and be between 18 and 34 years old. We recruited them through Facebook. So in terms of assessment of comprehension, we would hope that at the end of an informed consent process, participants would be able to answer these questions. What's the purpose? Um, who's eligible? Who's running it? Who's sponsoring it? Um, what kind of personal information will people collect? Um, is participating vol voluntary? And so we, we define these as sort of some core um, components of understanding what it was to be in the research study. And this is what, how we assess comprehension. The reason that we did this is uh, up to this point, when we did online surveys, we would um, put up a, uh, an informed consent on the computer screen. And then this is a scroll box that has the whole six page informed consent form in it. And if you've ever, you, you, you guys have prepared these, maybe you've been a participant and looked at one of these, but they're very long. And what we had people do was they had to scroll to, they had to get to the bottom of this screen. And then they had to say either I've read it and I want to participate or I don't want to participate. And then they could join. Um, this is how this looks. There's a scroll bar. Uh, as you read down through it, you pull down and you can't click I agree until you get to the bottom of it. And what we found was for this six page consent form that on average people spent 28 seconds between when they opened this page and when they said they agreed. And so that told us that people really weren't reading six pages. And when we talked to, uh, to participants in qualitative research, people think of this like the terms of agreement for the software on your phone or your computer, where every time there's a software update, you have to agree that if it breaks your phone or if it sends your personal information to people or um, if other horrible things happen that you won't hold uh, the phone manufacturer responsible. But most of us just take that, pull it all the way down and say agree to get on with our lives. And we think that's what was happening with consent. Sorry, wrong way. So um, what we did for the study was we had four different ways of providing consent. One was just this traditional consent where you get this uh, long list, you read it or don't read it and click. The next was an FAQ based consent. So instead of having that whole big document, you could go in and say, I'm interested in who's doing this. And if you click this, what's the purpose? It would open up and have a short statement of the purpose. So the whole consent form is essentially um, organized in this way and people can go in and look at what they're interested in. That's the FAQ format. And then we had two video based formats. One of them was produced. We hired a company to make this consent. Um, and I'll show you at least a little bit of it so you can get an idea. Um, the other was one of our colleagues whose name's Anthony and he sat down with a camera and he used the same script that we used in the professional video, but he just talked to the camera. And so our question here was, if you're gonna use a video consent to try and convey this information better, does it need to be something that's visually interesting and, um, and has a high production value or can it be something that can be done cheaply and simply uh, with, with a phone, camera on a phone. All right, so I'm gonna show you just a bit of the professionally produced video. Here we go. You've probably just clicked on a banner ad and are wondering, what's this study really about? This video will give you all of the information you need to know to decide if the study is right for you. The study is sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and led by Patrick Sullivan at Emory University. It will recruit about 5,000 men who have sex with men between 18 and 34 years old. What you tell us today will help make online studies easier to understand and surveys more interesting. It will also improve ongoing research to create and improve HIV prevention programs. If you join us today, you'll complete a 15-minute survey. Once completed, you'll receive $20 in the form of an Amazon gift card. You can quit. 
So you get the idea of this. And, and actually, I can, I'm going to make a list of stuff I'll send back out. If anybody wants to see the whole videos, um, they are available. Uh, basically, the, the staff produced video is just Anthony reading the same thing into the camera, um, as you saw on the previous slide. All right. So I'm going to ask you here, um, if our outcome is comprehension, understand, being able to answer those questions like, what is this study about? Um, what happens if I participate? Who's running it? Who's sponsoring it? Which of these things, which of these had the highest comprehension, do you think? The standard consent where you read it on the computer or the FAQ-based consent where you can open up the pieces you're interested in or the, the, the video consent or the FAQ and the video were equal to each other, but were better than the standard, or maybe you think all of these were equally effective. So we have a pretty good mix of B and C, but some people think maybe they were all equally effective. Um, some people think that the FAQ did as well as the video. So let's see what we found. So these show the comprehension scores by the standard consent, which is that, um, that scroll box, the FAQ consent, and then these are the two video consents, um, the professional one and the staff produced video. And interestingly, whether it was the, the professionally produced video, which was thousands of dollars to produce, or Anthony and his camera, we got about the same um, mean measure here of, uh, of comprehension. I want to just drill down a little bit more deeply into this. Um, so two of the out important outcomes here were how much time people spent in the consent process and their comprehension score. So in terms of time spent in the consent process, for those who use the standard consent in this study, they sent an average of 37 seconds on that page. For those who got the FAQ consent, they spent an average of 20 seconds on that page. And the two videos um, were each very close to two minutes on average, I'm sorry, on median. And so you can see that there was a lot more time spent by people in the consent process, um, five to six times more time spent when people got a video for the consent. And then the second point here is the consent comprehension store, score. And if we use that standard consent as a reference point, we can see that on average, whether it was the professionally produced or the researcher produced video, that respondents um, got almost two questions uh, correct more when they had the video consent. And what is, so what is that about? There's two things going on here. One is they spent more time. Two is um, they got a different format. So if we just plot the, con the comprehension score, um, which uh, could go up uh, as high as uh, 14 here, and the number of minutes, uh, the, I'm sorry, the log of time in the survey, you can see that even for those people who are in the standard arm and who just got a text box to read, the more time they spent on the consent, the higher their score was. And the same was true for the staff produced video for the professional video, sorry, for the two uh, videos that were, pro whether professional or staff, and for the FAQ. The other thing that you'll notice here is that com com this is the standard consent, this is the distribution of the log of the times. And notice that for both the professional videos, we have a lot more of the respondents in that arm who are pushed out here to the longer time periods, whereas in the standard consent, uh, there's uh, sort of a greater number of people on this side of that, that log two. So they, this graph represents that no matter how you got consent, the more time you spent, the more you understood, but that, that there were more people spending longer times in the professional and the, and the staff produced video. And so we were actually able to break this down with the help of our colleague, Eric Hall, to ask what were the contributions of those two components? So for the professional and staff produced video, uh, we can see that, that um, because of the direct effect, because somebody got video instead of a FAQ format, that was good for about one question higher in the correct score. And in addition, the people who got those videos spent more time. And so that is a relative indirect effect through time spent on the consent, and that accounted for about another 0.8 of a question.
So the reason that people got who got a video consent did better were two reasons. One, they spent more time, but even over and above that, the fact that it was video versus a written format improved consent. So that's just a, a note to say that, um, that we're using online tools for surveys more and more often. And there are a lot of great reasons to do that. Um, I'm going to show you one of those reasons um, now why sometimes we need a computer to get to the complexities of these questions. Um, but uh, uh, we have, there are some other things we have to take into account, like fraud, like consent and ethical issues and privacy. Um, and once we've taken care of all those things, um, we can use this for some fancy stuff. So let's, um, let's talk about that. In the US, um, new HIV infections disproportion disproportionately occur among MSM um, and largely among black MSM. So depending on the year, something between 65 and 70% of new infections um, come, uh, are, are experienced by gay and bisexual men. And between that, uh, you can see that um, by race, there are roughly equal numbers, or in some years, black MSM have more new infections, even though black MSM only constitute 13% of the population. And so black MSM are disproportionately impacted. The growth of the epidemic is not uniform. And so we can see that for MSM, these are rates of new diagnoses uh, and show that in the Southern US, um, where I live and work uh, mostly, but across the Southern US, that the rates of new HIV diagnoses um, are more than 1% per year uh, in, these, um, in these areas of the country. Um, just to, for context, uh, uh, while um, Christine was part of our group, um, we were working on um, this study called Involvement, which where we enrolled over 800 MSM in Atlanta, split between black and white MSM, and at baseline, just screen them for HIV prevalence. And here's what we found, is that in the 18 to 19 year olds, both black and white MSM had a six to 7% prevalence of HIV already by age 18. But if you compare that to the 20 to 24 year olds, by the time you get into this age group, the prevalence has risen dramatically in the black MSM, but kind of stays the same for the white MSM. And by age 30 to 39, 60% uh, of our participants uh, who were black were already living with HIV. And, uh, and you can see that uh, by this age, this population is already sort of maxed out, like all their risk is accrued, um, especially in this very young age period. So why is that? Um, Greg Millett uh, in 2004 laid out a series of hypotheses that might explain excess risk for black MSM. And they, some of them were maybe black MSM have more unprotected sex partners or a higher number of partners, or that they are less likely to identify as gay and disclose male-male sex so they're not getting the right prevention services. Maybe black MSM are more likely to abuse substances. Um, we find in actuality that uh, black MSM are less likely to self-report substance use. We'll come back to that. Um, and then some other areas uh, where, um, and the blue ones here, uh, I'm sorry, the blue ones here are the areas we think we can address with questionnaire data, which is the topic of this, um, uh, of this uh, talk. But there are other hypotheses like black MSM are more likely than others to have positive partners or sexual networks put men at risk um, or more incarceration leads to higher HIV risk. And note that these two boxes about black MSM are being more likely to have positive partners or that the sexual network's different, we can't just get from a questionnaire We really uh, about, about a person's behaviors. We really have to learn about partners. And this is a challenge for survey research. Um, yes, uh, the answer to Elizabeth is yes. The, uh, the last study was a cohort study. Um, so, um, so this is a, as a challenge for survey research because what we're trying to do is understand these, these complex sexual networks. So meet Joe. Joe is going to be our protagonist in, um, in talking about these studies. And Joe um, has male sex partners, and, and he may have three partners and do that in, in kind of a different time order. So scenario one is Joe 
first has sex with partner A for a while, and then he stops, and then he has sex with partner B, and then he stops, and then he has sex with partner C. Three sex partners. If we ask a question in a survey that says, how many partners did you have in the last six months? He says three. And we call this serial monogamy. Um, if Joe tells us he had three sex partners in the last six months, it could have also looked like this. And I'm going to play this once, and then I'm going to try and play it again. So here's another scenario, which is that Joe has sex with partner A, and at a certain point in that relationship, he starts having sex with B, he goes back to A, back to B, back to A, now to C, all the way to the end of C, and then back to A. So think about this scenario of concurrency, where here, if partner C is living with HIV, partner A is not at risk for acquiring HIV through his sexual relationship with Joe. Joe had sex with him before he even met partner C. Sorry. But in this situation, because, um, sorry, I'm going, I'm going to, I'm having a, Zoom is hard. It's really hard. All right. In the second scenario, um, all right, I'm going to, I give up. And the second scenario, Joe, uh, partner A uh, is at risk if partner C is living with HIV because Joe had sex with partner A and then partner C and then partner A again. And so it matters in our questionnaire design that we understand which of these patterns Joe had. And we're not going to get it by saying how many sex partners did you have in the last three months. So how do we measure this? So I just want to acknowledge that this um, this work is uh, the work that's led by my colleague Eli Rosenberg. Um, and uh, and um, gets at the idea that there are two mechanisms um, by which concurrency can confer risk to partners. One is this reachable path that in that last example, the, inf the HIV infection from partner C can reach partner A because of that um, pattern. So currency doesn't affect A's, uh, concurrency doesn't affect the risk of, of Joe in that scenario, but it affects the risks of Joe's partners. And it can be difficult to sort this out empirically. So we need to accurately measure concurrency. And to do that, and for epi analysis, we need to understand what's happening from Joe's perspective, but also what's happening um, with Joe and each of his partners and the timing of that, and then also how these relate to each other's. In other words, um, is Joe a connector between partners A and C? And then we have to ask about biologically relevant cofactors because nobody's at risk unless there's unprotected sex. And so the question is, how do we do this? One way is egocentric, which is we just ask Joe about his partners and we can ask Joe about what he knows about his partner's partners. And we try and construct these, these depictions based on the questions that we've asked Joe. That's called egocentric. The other is we ask Joe to send in his partners and then we ask his partners about their behaviors and we're able to put all this information together. So how do we design questionnaires for these studies? Um, here's an example of a way that we've done this in an egocentric way. So I mentioned the involvement study. And in this study, we, I showed you data from the baseline of this cohort study, but we asked men to come back at 3, 6, 12, 18, and 24 months. And every time we asked them about their patterns of sex partners. So we would say, during this six month period, list the names of everybody you had sex with. They could give them any names they wanted. So someone was DJ, someone was called party. And then they get this grid and they can check who they had sex with during which periods. And so we have this information now at the month level. And what we want to try and understand is the pattern of concurrency. So let's um, uh, take a closer look here. Um, to get the ego level factors, we just ask questions about the person. Um, remember, there are these three levels, ego, partnership, and, and triad. So I told you before I would show you what it looks like to document a survey uh, and um, to develop a code book. So here's an example of how we documented this. Uh, and um, and this, this item is called Orient. And people could either choose heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual, or they could write it in an other. Um, 
then we ask, there are different ways of referring guys um, we know uh, ha who have sex with men. We want to respect your preferences. During the survey, when we ask you about, um, about male partners, do you want us to say gay men or gay bi men or same gender loving men or two spirited men? And this is to be sort of culturally respectful. Um, again, I, I put up that little angry face before. If someone asks you a question um, and you feel like they should know the answer to that, you may be frustrated. If I consider myself to be a same gender loving man or a two spirited man, because that's my, the tradition of my culture, and you call me a gay man all the way through the survey, I'm gonna be annoyed by your survey. So this is a little piece of tailoring that just lets the survey be more sort of culturally competent for each participant. So that's ego level. Participant levels, we wanna get total partners by gender and partner type and whether people had um, unprotected anal intercourse. Here for our study, we just reused NHBS questions. They're well-developed, they've been tested tens of thousands of times. Um, and, uh, and, and so we reuse them. We use the partner name generator, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we did this partner by partner sexual history. Um, so we asked people um, to give their partners names uh, over the last uh, six months, starting with the most recent. And those names don't have to be their real names. They can be any way the, the participant can remember them. And then we construct this grid, which I showed you before. So let's take a look at a couple situations here. Um, Chris is a partner uh, that this respondent only had sex with in December. Um, he didn't have sex with anybody else in December. So Chris, by definition, cannot be a concurrent partner because only had one partner in that month. Compare that to November when our respondent had sex with both Tim and DJ. So this is scenario one. Do we know if he had sex with Tim and DJ in November of 2013, do we know for sure that that was a concurrent relationship? That could be a concurrent relationship. So Megan says no, and I agree with that. Maybe he had sex with Tim in week one, DJ in week two, Tim in week three, DJ in week four. That's concurrency. Or maybe he had sex with Tim in weeks one and two and DJ in week four, non-concurrent. So here we need to ask one more question to decide whether this is concurrent. And so we would ask this participant, you said that you had sex with both Tim and DJ in November 2013, uh, 2013. Which of these is true? I had sex with DJ before I had sex with Tim. I was having sex with both of them at the same time. And so, um, so this helps us resolve whether this was concurrency. Now look at situation three, which is that there are three people in the same month. Do we know that that's concurrency? Not necessarily. So we have to ask a follow-up question, which is I, I, I had sex with you, uh, with you, Enrique before I had sex with Patty. I had sex with Patty before I had sex with Enrique. Or I was having sex with both of them at the same time or don't know. And then we have to do the same question for the other pair. So this is just a computerized way of trying to resolve this question of concurrency. And it involves this grid, which we hope makes it an accessible item that people can know who they had sex with in which, which months. And it, um, it allows us to determine whether these patterns were concurrent or not. And I just wanna say, uh, and, and then the partner by partner dyadic says for each of these partners, Tell us about Chris. What was Chris's race? What is Chris's age? Is he a main partner? Is he a casual partner? Did you talk about Sarah's status? And so that series of questions is asked for each partner. And here's an example of that. Um, tell us a little bit more about you and Chris. Did you have sex with Chris more than once, uh, once or more than once during that period? Is he someone you feel committed to above, above all others? Um, is he someone you exchanged uh, had sex with in exchange for money, food, drugs, or something else. Okay, so I'm going to uh, move through this a bit um, and show you that in this study, at the baseline survey, we ask about up to five partners. In the six-month survey, we repeated those, um, those uh, par questions about those partners if they were still partners, and the participant could add up to five new partners. So we had a total of 10 in the six-month survey, um, and then we sort of went through 
uh, month, you know, six month period by six month period and collected information for potentially dozens of partners and the, the structure of their uh, networks. So you may feel tired um, after seeing this. Uh, I, I will send, I'm gonna make a list of also, I will send to, um, to, uh, to Christine the paper that Eli Rosenberg wrote about this, this system. And if you wanted to use it, there's actually resources in there so you don't have to um, reinvent all that. Um, so why do we go to all this effort? It's because we wanna understand these networks and how they convey risk. And so um, Eli um, also uh, helped lead the MAN project, which was a study where we recruited seed MSM and then we asked them to refer us to their sex partners um, and invited the sex partners to come in and describe these networks. This diagram is actually, um, each one of these is a network of MSM. You can see that some networks just have the participant we recruited and one partner. This may be a monogamous um, uh, you know, relationship. Some of these had quite large networks where they referred several partners and each of those referred more partners and so on. Um, so this is what the sexual networks of these men look like. Uh, we tested everyone for HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis, and did this sort of extensive CASI study uh, to understand the networks. And so part of the reason we wanted to understand this was to understand this idea that the prevalence of HIV positive partners might be higher in white versus black networks. So remember that for these men in white networks, we call in their network partners and we test those partners for HIV. So the first sort of high level observation here is that the HIV prevalence among the network partners of white MS was about 3%, sorry, uh, our daughter's bad dog. Um, and the network, pre the HIV prevalence among the partners of black men was 36%. So that, um, that hypothesis that black partners may, black men may have more positive partners bore out. And in fact, when we break down those, those black participants by age, we find that there's also variation in the prevalence of positivity in the partners by the age of these men. So the youngest men had about 27% um, positive partners. And then this is the, um, the perceived status of those partners. So when young black MSM told us that they had HIV negative partners and we tested those partners, 9% of those partners that were believed to be HIV negative were actually positive. And, and so this just sort of speaks to the risk for these younger black MSM when they may be actually be asking, discussing sera status uh, with partners, but those partners may not know that they're living with HIV. So that's why it's worth um, doing this. In the same way, we ask question about um, sera sorting. So if, if, if men go through the process of asking partners, are you HIV positive or HIV negative? I ask um, and a partner says, I'm HIV negative. This shows what the actual prevalence was based on what partners were told. So among black men who ask, they had 51 partners who had reported being HIV negative, And of those 20% were actually living with HIV. In white men, uh, who ha whose partners said that they were HIV negative, only two and a half percent of those were HIV. So comparing these boxes, for black men who say their partners were negative, 20% of them are negative. For white men whose partners were believed to be negative, it was only two and a half percent. If you're a black MSM and your partner uh, status is unknown, there's a 50% chance that he's living with HIV. For white men, that was zero percent. So I hope that you can see that although these are, um, these are complicated processes, that this really gives you insight into some of the things that may be driving excess uh, HIV incidents in black MSM. And they're insights that you could only get by understanding the networks in this way. And the last thing I'll say is validate, validate, validate. So we, we worry in, um, in HIV, uh, in questionnaire studies about uh, social desirability bias. And so Sandra asked about this, um, about how, what we do about this. And so when something's important, um, we wanna try and validate it if we can. And I'll give you two examples. I showed you this, um, uh, 
uh, uh, this data from the, the involvement study earlier about HIV prevalence. And, and basically at baseline, we asked men when they came in the door, are you, as far as you know, are you living with HIV or not? And this is what we got. Um, and, and then we tested them. So among all the black men who were living with HIV, a third of them, when they came in, said that they were HIV negative. So we called them unaware by self-report. For white men, that was only 16% of the HIV positive white men who said that they believed themselves to be negative when they came in. And when you look at this, it, it's a significant difference. And so we say in our prevent, we, we used to say in our prevention programs, one of the problems is that black MSM um, are less aware of their HIV positive status, and therefore we need to increase testing programs. Uh, my colleague, Travis Sanchez, um, followed up this up by when we did that testing at baseline, we also measured men's viral loads. And so if you assume that anybody with a completely suppressed viral load uh, who's living with HIV knows that he's living with HIV uh, because is, and is taking medications, then that difference looks like 25% and 16%, no longer significant. We also look for antiretrovirals in the blood specimens of the men who said that they knew that they were living with HIV or not. And if you just uh, consider men who ha are taking ARVs, we say they must have known their status. 26% uh, of black MSM might be unaware and 16% of white MSM. And finally, we used case surveillance um, from the state to determine who had had a previous positive HIV test that had been reported to the state. And by that metric, um, the same, essentially the same proportion of black and white MSM had had a positive HIV test in the past. So what we know is that, um, that, uh, that saying that you have HIV can feel very stigmatizing and that, um, and that sometimes uh, in different communities that that disclosure is perceived different ways. And so what Travis I think showed here is that we need to be cautious about self-reported lack of awareness um, be, because for some very understandable uh, reasons, men may be hesitant to disclose that um, to researchers. And I'll just end by saying, um, with respect to drug use, Greg Millett's slide said that black MSM are actually less likely to report substance use than white MSM. Here, we both ask men to, um, to self-report substance use, and we measured it with a, um, a, a biological urine test. And for marijuana use, uh, black men were actually less likely to report marijuana use than white men, but when measured in the urine, they were actually more likely to have um, used marijuana as indicated by urine tests. So this is an example of switchover bias, which we very rarely see, we talk about, but we very rarely see, where something appears to be protective, but is in fact a risk. And I just want to say that um, I understand, and, there, and there's good reasons to think that Black uh, men would deny use of substances because we know that they're differentially singled out for arrest and prosecution in our criminal justice system. So this is an adaptive response. And yet, if we want to understand these data and make public health recommendations based on them, we need to validate these and understand that the sensitivity of self-report for all of these drugs was substantially less for Black men. It emphasizes the importance of having biological measures. All right, I just want to end by saying um, that uh, our Emory University CIFAR has a HIPAA compliant survey platform that if you're using it for HIV prevention research, we will provide to you without cost. Um, so you can contact me or go through the Emory CIFAR page. Um, and a lot of the surveys and items that I've talked about are already programmed in this system. So you're free to use those. We have iPads and tablets that you can use for survey administration for, for limited periods of time that we'll lend to you for free. All those concurrency modules are pre-programmed. We can help with survey design. Um, I'll also refer you to Network Canvas, which is offered through Michelle Burkett at NWU. And many of the CTSAs um, have REDCap and other survey um, systems. And so I encourage you to take advantage of these resources, either through our CFAR, through your UW CFAR, which is fantastic, or um, through CTSAs. And I'll just um, end with this um, summary, which is that STI studies really are different because of the complexity of the networks and the sensitivity of the topics. I think that electronic survey information helps us to collect more nuanced data and maybe better for social desirability bias. 
Um, consent for online surveys can be problematic, but consider video consent. Um, and uh, validation of key constructs is critical. And don't reinvent the wheel. There are some great tools available that are validated um, and they're available for free. So please go to the CDC website, go to um, UNAIDS website, go to uh, ask researchers who've done um, studies if you can use their questions. So I'll stop there.